Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Sharpening Report. I am your host, Josh Peck. Well, today, we welcome back to the show our very good friend, Dr. Ken Johnson, who has authored numerous books and translations having to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls, Ancient History, and Prophecy. Today, we're going to look at some prophecies from within these ancient texts that may shed some light on how close we are to the rapture and how close the world is to the tribulation. But first, if you are viewing on YouTube or Rumble, please subscribe. And uh, on YouTube, click the bell for all notifications so you know when we post a new video, which has uh, been uh, fairly frequently lately. Uh, also, if you want this full video uh, here, head on over to dailyrenegade.com. The link is in the description and get a membership today. I will get more into that later. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Ken Johnson back to the show. How are you doing, Ken? Doing good. Thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on and uh, thanks for being able to do it on, on such short notice. I've been trying to uh, schedule as many of these as I can before I move. Uh, the audience already knows. Um, and, well, I, I, if, if, you're, if, you're, if people are viewing uh, for the first time, uh, I'm moving to go work at Prophecy Watchers, and uh, I'll be there next week. So I've been trying to cram in as many interviews as I can before that. So really appreciate you taking the time for this. Congratulations on going to Prophecy Watchers. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's going to be great. Well, let's jump right in. So one thing that people seem really interested in is Enoch's Apocalypse of Weeks. Can you give us some background on what this pro prophecy is, and uh, what are some key points that stand out to you? Well, it's a prophecy found in the book of Enoch, and basically he takes all of human history, the Essenes and almost everyone earlier, uh, pre-flood, post-flood, uh, up to the time of the, of the Messiah, had a calendar, and they basically taught that there'd be 7,000 years of human history, 6,000 of human, and then like a 1,000-year millennial reign of the Messiah, same thing that's taught in Revelation. And so we usually break it up in sets of ages of 2,000 years or, or millennia, you know, like 6,000 years, which is what the um, uh, symbol of the uh, Sabbath basically taught, six working days and one day to rest. And so Enoch did a little bit different. Each day was a century. And so you have a week of centuries, so 700 years. So he would break it up into like the first 700 years, the second 700 years, and so on. But in each one of those, he talked about uh, uh, the temple being built or the Messiah coming or the kingdom age or things like that. So they're very fascinating. They're very accurate and just some really big prophecies for that 700 year time period. <coughs> Excuse me. Where are we in that prophecy and how, how can we actually tell? Um, one of the things is in the last 700 years, it talks about uh, a judgment and gives you some information that we're talking about a thousand year period. So that puts us the 300 years into the other or the, the previous day or week. And so it, what's interesting about it is it, it puts us into within the, the last couple of hundred years, the time for the beginning of the millennium. So there's several other books and several other scrolls that talk about that. So we're getting very, very close to the last Jubilee the time when uh, most of the prophecies would be fulfilled, and then the time of uh, the second coming, which should start the kingdom age. Yeah, which is really exciting. And and wh when, I, when I looked into it, I was blown away to find out, I, I believe that we're right in the middle of the ninth week in that prophecy. And uh, when you do the timing, the middle of the ninth week is uh, 2025. Well, between 2025, 2026, somewhere around there. But so we're like right on the doorsteps of that, which is uh, really, really amazing. Um, there's a couple of more uh, more obscure prophecies that you found. And uh, I believe it was in the apocalypse of Ezra, but correct me if I'm wrong, having something to do with uh, our food and a problem with our, our memories in the end times. Can you explain that whole prophecy and how that probably uh, connects with our time today? Yeah, it's in the Ezra apocalypse, but it's actually in some scrolls and uh, several other places, probably five or six different places. It's just one of the prophecies of the end times. There's atmospheric things, there's wars, there's earthquakes, there's all sorts of different kinds of prophecies. But one of them is that we begin to develop problems with our health because of the kind of food we're eating and or what we're breathing or toxins of some sort. Uh, the basic teaching is that if you eat the proper herbs and you eat a proper diet and get plenty of exercise, which that was easy back then, 
um, that you basically can live to be 120. And most of the scrolls and even Josephus and other people from the first century said that the average Gentile lived to be about 60. The average Pharisee, maybe 70 or so. The average Essene lived to be 120, just like they did back in, in Abraham's time or shortly thereafter. And so this whole idea of eating proper herbs and that kind of stuff. So then there's a set of prophecies that talk about it gets bad at the end times. So each church, for instance, or group of people is supposed to have a, a pastor who has a heart for the Lord, a prophecy expert, and an herbal medicine expert. If you don't have those three people in leadership, you don't really have a church. So I just thought that was interesting the way they talk about it. But some of the things are we develop this odd form of uh, forgetfulness. And of course, everybody gets a little, I, I'm doing the same thing. I'm in my 50s, almost 60. Uh, but I will forget stuff. I'll stop for a minute and think, wait a minute, but Josh Peck, that's his name. You know, I'll do this kind of stuff. <laughs> but I remember what I'm talking about. It just takes a second to come. And then, um, but with stuff like Alzheimer's, once it's gone, it's gone. I, I don't know who you are and I never will remember who you are. Those memories are actually gone. So it talks about that kind of thing. And it says it's because of the evil of our generation, which to me means greed. Um, and we have things like excitotoxins that are put in the food that make you think you like the food better so that you buy some more, eat more. And that's wonderful for the pocketbook. If I'm selling you something, you'll get more of my stuff. But it kind of makes you remind you of the drug dealer that gives you a free sample to get you hooked and then charges you. And then you'll steal, kill, do anything to get it. So it's it's kind of a legalized form of that, I guess. And so no specifics in exactly what it is, but it's about uh, because of the evil of the age, uh, we have problems with food. We have problems with other things. And there is an unnatural forgetfulness and there is um, unnatural anxiety and several other things like that. The scrolls talk about the, the whole idea of uh, uh, going back to agriculture, growing your own herbs, things like that, to continue to live a, a good lifespan. So it's fascinating to look at that. It even talks about uh, aging process begins to get worse. So if you think about it, pre-flood, we had lived to be seven to 800, 900 years old. Post-flood, we lived to be about four. And then about four or five generations into it, something else happened. And th then we began to live 200. And it kind of trickled down. But the 120 is just kind of standard for us now or should be. And there's actually about six or seven different uh, ethnic groups around the globe that still live to be 120 because of how they eat and what they do. So it's it's fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing how that was predicted so long ago. I don't know if I'm remembering this right. This is this is just off my memory, which is, it's fading too. So, uh, but wasn't there? It, it might have been in a different place or a totally different book, but I, I thought it, it might have been in the Ezra Apocalypse. Wasn't there something about like babies will start speaking like earlier than the, than the normal or something? Yeah, like there's that? several is that several of those. I think one of them might be in the Ezra Apocalypse too. That's part of the uh, the aging process. It said that the babies mm. would start speaking before one year old. That doesn't necessarily mean carrying on a college age conversation, but um, and I'm not sure where we're at now. The, some of the stuff was uh, babies would be born at four months and live. You know, it used to be mm. that a, a seven month uh, premature baby at seven months probably won't live. And now it's like, oh, that's a done deal unless there's something weird. What it, it depends on what caused the spontaneous abortion. But uh, six months and then there's been a few at five, but it, that's really cutting it close. But our technology keeps going. But it talks about uh, babies being born, speaking about one one year or so. It talks about people uh, like most of us gray at 40 or 50 or maybe 60 if you're lucky. I grayed early uh, in my <laughs> 40s. But it talks about people graying in their 20s. And so the whole concept of the lifespan uh, and gestation periods, the whole thing goes down. So you, you can figure this if if you look at the post pre-flood world. Uh, they started having kids at 130 years old and they lived to be about mm -hmm. 900. Today, you could probably father or give birth successfully at 13 and we live to be 90. 
So it's basically the same ratio just kind of ran down. So apparently that happens again. So the whole idea to me, though, I thought is interesting about that is that if you have uh, something like that happen, the idea of it taking generation after generation going down a year and then a year and then a year means the Lord's not coming back for a few hundred years. And I don't, I don't believe that. I think the Lord's coming back pretty quick. So that makes it sound like, um, in addition to food and toxins kind of giving us diseases, somebody tries to do something, maybe through some sort of genetic manipulation to fix a disease or something, and it causes a backwards aging or something like that. It's just kind of, yeah. it doesn't say, but for something like that to happen and it be completely fulfilled in, say, like a seven-year period or in the next five years or something, that would be pretty it'd have to be something like that. So we need to very carefully watch our medicine. And that's what the scrolls talked about a lot of times, the whole idea of the book of Hagi, to have herbs uh, that fix your problems or keep you healthy. And they they believed in the Nephilim. So the whole idea of genetic experiments causing the uh, mixtures of species, but also some of them didn't work out so well. So there's always problems. And the concept was that somehow toward the end of our age, they begin to bring back what they call Nephilim medicine. So things dealing with genetics. I'm not saying if they have a genetic cure that's going to fix your lungs or let you see again or whatever that you shouldn't do it. But it's that's the crossroads where you have to start looking very careful at what we're doing. Yeah, wow. That's, that's a good way to describe it, Nephilim medicine. And, and we're seeing a lot of advancements in technology, genetics. I mean, it's getting really bad. And I, you know, I wonder uh, if, if it's this bad now when we actually have Christians on the earth and the Holy Spirit is is in Christians, imagine after the rapture, how much worse it's going to get, you know, the greed and the corruption and uh, how, 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 how much worse. And, and speaking of that, um, there's something that you brought up before about the rapture and this idea of, of shining or the shining ones that, that show up in the Dead Sea Scrolls in the book of Daniel. Can you explain that? Uh, and w- where do these references show up? Who are these these shining ones and what does that have to do with the rapture? Uh, well, remember the, the Lord uh, at the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he was walking along and all of a sudden Enoch and or no Moses and Elijah showed up and it, they were all transfigured formed and kind of in glowing form or glorified form. And then after that event, everything was kind of normal. So we get an idea the glorified form actually gives off light. Um, and you see that in a couple of other places. The scrolls talk about a time when, when the Messiah was in Qumran and the Pharisees came down to arrest him, but it wasn't yet his time. And it simply says he manifested and they left. So we have the same kind of thing when they go to arrest him and and he says, I am, and they all fall back. So there's some really interesting things uh, about that. But in Daniel 12, that's one of the things that I think is probably the easiest uh, scripture to see a pre-trib rapture. And because the whole concept is it talks about there's a time where there's a resurrection and then there are shining ones. So Paul tells us the resurrection and the rapture happens at the same time in the twinkling of an eye. And so whenever this happens, there are people in their glorified bodies. And then it talks about the righteous at that point shine like the stars. And uh, some of that is idiomatic, but it actually has a reference to the glorified form. And then it talks about from the time of the resurrection, which also includes the rapture, um, three and a half years later is the abomination desolation and the starting of the persecution. And then it says the persecution lasts, uh, not 1260, but 1290 days. And so I'm not sure exactly how they overlap, but it tells, it shows us that it's two separate time periods. There's a 1260 and then there's a 1290 and they kind of go back to back or overlap a little bit. But if you have a rapture resurrection, and basically three and a half years to a, to a abomination and basically three and a half years more or less to when everything is fixed, that's a pre-trib rapture. So it's fascinating just to kind of see that. And most of us, we, we go to um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and Paul explains it very well then. But a lot of people that are not pre-trib have come up with ideas on why the revealing of the Antichrist is really this or really that. And if you plug in Daniel 12, it, it, it's pretty much a done deal. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And and you and I are both uh, pre-trib rapture believers. And uh, we actually have a, a viewer question relating to this. And we'll, we'll get more into viewer questions a bit later. But since this one is so similar to my question, I wanted to bring it up here. So I'll read hers and then I'll read mine after. But uh, Shanna wrote, uh, he, he has addressed it in detail on more than one occasion before, but maybe he can touch on his studies of the pre-trib uh, beliefs of ancient writers alive long before the quote Darby invented it nonsense that uh, cycles around repeatedly. Uh, and so that's her question. My question, which is very similar, is do you believe uh, that the Dead Sea Scrolls and possibly other ancient texts, such as from the ancient church fathers, teach pre trib rapture? And if so, what would be the best few examples that you could bring up? Um, actually, yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, the problem, I think, comes from being in a denomination that believes a certain way, and then if you find evidence the contrary, you just say, well, that has to be symbolic or whatever, because if it is, I've got to change my way of thinking. I've actually had people tell me that, because the whole idea of uh, Israel coming back, fulfilling prophecies, they say, well, it's not possible because uh, we're Israel, okay? And I understand that kind of theology, and that actually makes a little bit of sense, at least up until 1948. But when I point out the fact that they were supposed to come back and they did, and not only that, they were supposed to come back on a specific date and they did. So how do you, you know, wrap your head around that? And I was actually told by one guy, it's like, well, it, it, we don't know, but it just flat has to be a coincidence because otherwise our denomination is wrong and we are not going there. And it's just like, okay, that's almost fair as uh, Sadducee talk. That's kinging on blasphemy there. So when Messiah comes and he's not exactly who you thought he was, and you thought your denomination was correct and it's not, change denominations. Just follow Messiah. None of us are correct 100%, but whatever Messiah says when he comes, just do it. But um, the same kind of thing happens with this idea. It's like, well, Darby made it very, very popular. And before that, it wasn't known very well. But you've got to remember, in the Middle Ages, almost everyone was Catholic, okay? A Catholic Eastern Orthodox. And uh, there's always been people that have believed differently. But the vast majority, at least of books that we have and things, all taught Catholic doctrine. You know, and so that's like saying, well, in the Middle Ages, everybody prayed to Mary, so we should pray to Mary. Well, no, I'm not Catholic. <laughs> And there were people before the Catholics, you know, in the first century that made comments like Mary's not a goddess. We don't pray to dead people. It's a horrible sin. You know, this kind of a thing. Uh, and they might be right and they might be wrong, but that's what they said. And it's the same thing with that. You've got several references in the Ezra apocalypse about a group of people that are taken away before the destruction comes. And if you are here. And if you manage to survive that tribulation period, at the end of it, you'll see that group of people come back, you know, and there's a lot of things like that. Even in the book of Enoch, it talks about a group of people that come and go and come back. And a lot of people talk about, well, why are we so special? We would get out of tribulation and we're not special. And it just, we happen to benefit from God's plan. The whole concept, according to the book of Enoch, is that it's to engender repentance. So the whole idea that everybody knows this wacky rapture idea, which is ridiculous, and then all of a sudden millions of people disappear, they're going to say, okay, it's not so ridiculous. It's, it's the last ditch effort to for help you to understand the prophecies are real so that you can possibly get saved. And that's basically what the scrolls are talking about. But you've got Irenaeus and Hippolytus. Uh, you've got the epistle of Barnabas. You've got uh, several people that talk about that. There's even a reference at, to a pretty clear reference. Well, actually, I say three clear references to a pre-trib rapture in the Didache. And there's other first century testaments. Um, and then there's a few other things like that real early on. But even in the, the Middle Ages, like 15, 16, and 1700s before Darby, there are a lot of people that talked about if we're reading this right, Israel has to come back. And then there's a time of what they call the catching away or a rapt, R-I-P-T. They use different terms. It's whatever language they were from, but the concept of some sort of a harpazo taking away. So yeah, you can debate whether there's a pre-trib rapture, but you can't debate that it was taught before. I mean, that that's like me saying, I think the King James Bible was invented in the 1950s. 
Well, we all have grandfathers and grandmothers that have had King James Bibles. It's got to go back at least a couple hundred, well, at least a hundred years, you know, so you can't say that kind of stuff. There's too much evidence. Yeah, I totally agree. And and it's, it's I, I think it's really telling when you see people online that are just flat out against the pre-trib rapture. They think it's like a doctrine of demons and all this stuff. And they'll use the most extreme language that, that they can. And usually, you know, when you see uh, most pre-trib rapture believers, and, you know, nobody's perfect. You're, you're going to get it on all sides. But uh, from at least the people that I've interviewed and talked to about it and, and the way that I, I try to be is, we, you know, we just don't fight about it and we just talk about it, you know, like we're talking about. But, yeah, some people get, like, really, really upset. And usually, I, I find usually when emotion starts getting into it, when somebody has to passionately, you, you know, and, and angrily uh, – spout their opinion a lot of times it's because there's not as much fact to back it up so they have to supplement it with emotion which kind of tells me that's that's probably not uh that, that's probably a sign that maybe at least this person uh doesn't have as much information as they think that they do there's actually a, there's actually an early church father that predicted signs of the end you know like earthquakes and stuff pulling from scriptures one of the unique things that he mentioned is that there would be much contention about his coming that's really all wow. they said. But now that we're in this time period, we can see that. Because if I was to say I, I thought the Magog War was at the end of the tribulation or it was before, it was 30 years before, you'd say probably, I don't see it that way, but whatever. And we yeah. could argue, I mean, mention stuff like that all day long and neither one of us would get upset. But when you say pre-trib, it's all of a sudden we're ready to fight. And I just thought that was fascinating that the early church father, his name was Isaiah. Uh, said the same thing. Wow. Yeah, that really is. I didn't know that. that that's fascinating. Uh, well, we're definitely seeing that today. Um, you, you put together a, a phenomenal book uh, called uh, Gad the Seer, and uh, many people might not have heard that uh, name before. Who, who was Gad the Seer, Gad the Seer and uh, what did he prophesy, and how might that connect with events that we're seeing play out today? Uh, well, it's fascinating because in the Bible, back in Chronicles, Kings and Chronicles, we're told during the days of Samuel with uh, Saul, David, and Solomon in that particular era, there were five uh, prophets that wrote books of prophecy. There was Gad, Nathan, Ahijah, Shemaiah, and Iddo. And for whatever reason, they were not put in the canon, but there was a group of Jews that did keep uh, those records. And they've come out in, in other places too. So I was able to get the text of Gad the seer um, and part of Nathan, and I'm still working on trying to get some of the others, but they're just ancient prophets from around 1000 BC, and very, very fascinating. Uh, Gad prophesies what I believe to be very clearly a pre-trib rapture, among other things, in chapter 14. Uh, but some of the fascinating things is he begins to identify, we're always looking for that uh, Babylonian mystery religion in Revelation, which is described as a harlot, it's it's Babylon, it's, you know, this kind of stuff. And there's enough things in scriptures to kind of connect them, but you still aren't never quite sure, you know. And so Gad comes out and says, basically, there will be two anti-Semitic powerful religions. And he describes them, one from south, headquartered south of where Israel's at, and their symbol is a crescent moon. Okay, so I think I know who that is. And the other one is a group of people led by one guy who actually is Trinitarian, not completely monotheistic. Remember back in the ancient days, everybody knew God, well, the prophets did, and they were Trinitarian, but according to the scrolls. But uh, this group, even though they seem good, they're headquartered in Rome, Italy. And of course, back in that day, there wasn't much of anything in Rome, Italy, and nothing in Saudi Arabia, basically. But these two become very powerful anti-Semitic religious powers, but they're not the problem. Somewhere toward, they probably fight amongst them uh, themselves as far as we know, but somewhere toward the end of time, either they or factions from those two groups form this other religion and it becomes the dominant, what they call the harlot religion. That's what Gad teaches. So today we would say that's some sort of Chrislam or some sort of combination type thing. Not sure exactly how it manifests, but to have these scrolls talk about those things and like the, the Dead Sea Scroll Testament of Noah giving us more information about the empires and how they come together. It's very, very fascinating. 
Yeah, especially since we we've been seeing the uh, you know the rise of Islam and, and Christ, Christians that uh, you know well, so called Christians that that believe that Christianity and Islam worship the same God, which you know when you, when you actually look at the text, it couldn't be more different. But we've been we've been seeing that uh, kind of rise up for a couple of decades now. Um, it's not super huge, but it's it's growing and and I, I can definitely see how something like that would be uh, could, could explode in the end in the end days. Um, one, one people what one topic that people really love uh, is the ancient Dead Sea Scroll calendar and we've done a ton of interviews about that but uh, for those uh, who might not be familiar for those new to the channel we've been getting actually a lot of uh, more uh, new people viewing the channel which is great. Um, could you go through just kind of how this calendar works, how the Essenes uh, would have used it, how it applies to the Bible, and what we can learn from it prophetically? Sure. It's fascinating because it's not prophetic in and of itself, uh, but the calendar is amazing. Most of us know about a Jewish calendar. Uh, there's Nisan and Tishrei and, and the, the 12 months of the year, and comparing it to our 12 months on our Gregorian calendar. Ours is solar. The modern Jewish calendar is lunar. This one is solar. So according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I guess there's no way to really prove or disprove this, but it's their calendar and their explanation, is that God gave the original calendar. It clearly shows the uh, the Sabbaths and the festivals of the year. It shows the years, the Shemitahs, the Jubilees, and the centuries, uh, Onas and ages. And so there are several things that they plug into, like, for instance, one of the scrolls talks about Messiah dying for our sins. And that event is one Shemitah after the uh, uh, ninth Jubilee of their Ona, which they were in Ona 8. And so when you plug that into the Gregorian calendar, it means the Messiah is supposed to die in 32 AD, which fits perfectly with what you know, as Christians believe. And so there's several other things like that, and the prophecies kind of connect all those dots. So we know exactly where we are on the calendar line. So again, we're all looking for that year 6,000. And that last Jubilee period before is when a lot of prophecy occurs, a lot of the rapture, the, the tribulation, the second coming, Antichrist, all that's in there somewhere. And not necessarily at the beginning or at the end, but somewhere in there. And we're approaching that really quickly. Uh, March, which is, you know, actually next Tuesday from where we're, the time we're doing this, is the Essene, on the Essene calendar, the new year. So that begins the Shemitah year, the last one of this Jubilee or this generation, then we have a Jubilee year, then we start the very last 50-year period, uh, which is called the last generation. So that's really interesting for a lot of Bible prophecy people. But it basically uh, does that. It works out that way. And the interesting thing about it, we all believe that there's no filler in Scripture. So when it says Jesus did something and then five days later something happened, you're supposed to know exactly what we're talking about. And most of us would say we'd have to grab a calendar and try to figure out the year and then the date, and, you know. And the way the calendar works, it's very simple and very easy. If I was to ask you what day was New Year's on, you'd say, well, it was the first of January, but it's different every year. It might have been Wednesday or Thursday or who knows. We'd have to get a calendar to look. Well, the calendar always happens on the Wednesday closest to the spring equinox. Uh, so that's always New Year's. So Passover is always on Tuesday, the 14th, you know, and on down like this. So when it says that, you know, Jesus had the Passover Seder three days and three day, nights later, he resurrected. You can just, you don't even really have to look at the calendar. You can just do it in your head. And so all these things instantly come out. Like, for instance, uh, John 2, when he goes to the wedding of Cana, it says that it was on the third day. And we're like, third day of what? Third day of the week? What are we talking about? I have no clue. Well, if you knew the calendar, you know exactly what they're talking about. A lot of weddings, like we have June weddings. Everybody wants a June wedding. Uh, a lot of, for, for several reasons, a lot of people had their wedding on the festival of new uh, wine. And that is the third of uh, Av is when that takes place. So he's in there for a wedding in Cana on the 3rd, obviously the 3rd of all, Festival of New Wine. And he, he arranges this to turn water into wine. So if we knew more about that festival, it would probably make a lot more sense to us what, what's going on. But just things like that. You, Moses did something. Five days later, something happened. 
you know if it was a Sabbath, what day of the week, what closest festival it was, the date even a lot of times. And you just know a lot of stuff. And that helps you figure out a lot of prophecy. Yeah, it's it's phenomenal. And uh, I mean, because of that calendar, we know that we we definitely live in some really interesting times. I mean, like you said, the the final jubilee is set to uh, start in like a year or from now or something. And and for people out there that are are worried, thinking like, oh my gosh, I have to wait till twenty seventy five before Jesus returns. We need to remember there is a, a, a rapture that happens before, and we don't know when that happens. The rapture isn't the thing that kicks off the tribulation period. It's the uh, confirmation of the covenant with many. So we, you could have a rapture pretty early, and it could be years or even possibly decades between that and the start of the tribulation. Or if it if it is around the same time, we don't know uh, how long after the tribulation, when when Jesus comes back and takes care of everything, we don't know how long those judgments take. We don't know how long it takes to figure out what they're going to do with the temple, whether they're going to cleanse it or just rebuild it. I mean, we read in Ezekiel, there's this uh, amazing city and temple that's probably going to take some time to build. I don't think Jesus is just going to snap his fingers and it's all just going to appear immediately. Uh, he could do it like that, but I, I, I think that's actually going to be built. That could take some time. So you could have an early uh, rapture and tribulation and still have some time before actually the, the official start of that um, millennium. And, uh, and you know, we when we look at the, the way that the Torah age ended, Technically, that would have ended around 75 A.D. Now, we would say the church age started uh, 32 A.D. when the when the with the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So there 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 is kind of an overlap to some of these events uh, and, and, and how it could all play out. So I just don't want any. But if somebody's uh, viewing this for the first time, don't worry. I, nobody's saying that we're absolutely going to have to wait till 2075 uh, for something to happen. Uh, could could be. But but we, we don't necessarily have to. Uh, believe that that would be the case. Um, it certainly didn't happen like that at the end of the Torah age. Stuff uh, prophecies started getting fulfilled pretty early. Oh, and I should mention uh, because of the calendar, Ken and I have available a print version of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar that has uh, not only the ancient calendar that the Essenes would have used, but also our normal calendar that we use today. So you can look to any day and see if there's anything significant, like a feast day or anything like that. I have a link to it in the description below, or you can go to dailyrenegade.com and find it there, or you can go to uh, Ken's website at biblefacts.org. Uh, and all of the, all of those, all of the proceeds for those are split between Ken and I. And it really does help uh, both of our ministries continue so we can keep bringing you content like this. So I wanted to make mention of that. There's also an online version too at dsscalendar.org. Uh, um, <clears throat> before we get to the members only section, in your opinion, what, what are some of the most uh, exciting and prominent prophecies that you found in your research? And I know we can't set dates, but how close do you believe that we might be to the rapture and tribulation? Well, um, kind of like what you were saying, the rapture could be at any time. Um, I think it is closer to the beginning of the tribulation than, you know, like a really large gap or something. Uh, that being said, I've often thought that 2075 either is the second coming or the dedication of the temple. And if we have to build some, you know, the Lord could do whatever, but it just seems like he's going to have us build it or it comes in pieces or whatever. So that may take uh, 10, 20, 30 years or so. So. Uh, it is interesting that they have, they, it was, the scrolls prophesied a 40-year gap between the death of the Messiah and the end of the age. And they prophesy a seven-year gap uh, at the end of our age, where there's this Gentile king uh, who's claiming to be God incarnate, son of God, the Messiah. And it's really, really fascinating, uh, all those things, of how they look at Daniel. And I think we're getting really close to that end of that age. I really thought that we wouldn't see any kind of prophecy at all until we get in that last 50 year period. Uh, but apparently I was wrong because last year uh, the Hamas war started and Israel is very intent to actually finish the, the, the problem. If they do, that will actually fulfill Obadiah, Zephaniah and a few of the other prophecies because they uh, eliminate Hamas. And that's one thing that the Dead Sea Scrolls taught is that uh, the Psalms teach prophecy, and one of the one of the ways that you understand prophecy is that a psalm or a passage of scripture is written about 
uh, as a song and it's played on a certain musical instrument. And if a certain musical instrument has, you know, four key, uh, four strings or 10 strings or whatever, that tells you the una that it's supposed to be in, if it's a prophetic psalm. And so we have uh, things about uh, the 12th una, which is our, our age, about uh, prophecies like out of Amos 6, about a government seat or structure in Gath of the Philistines named violence. Well, when you put that in English, you're talking about a government structure of the Gaza Strip who calls themselves Hamas. And they cause a problem with Israel and eventually are eradicated. And in the process of doing this, Israel uh, takes and holds southern Lebanon. It tells us where the new border is going to be at. And then they colonize the Negev. And then there's a whole bunch of other things. We've got the destruction of uh, Damascus. We've got a war between Israel and Iran. And that's actually mentioned in the book of Enoch also, which has got some very interesting details in Enoch that scripture doesn't have. Um, and then there's, uh, like I say, the colonizing of the Negev. The Benjamite tribe is found and, and, bring, and uh, migrates home. There's several other prophecies like that that we might get to see because those may happen, especially if like Benjamites come home and then they're the ones that colonize and it takes five or ten years or whatever then we might begin to see some of that stuff immediately after this war. So it's really fascinating. We've got the Gog and Magog war involving Russia. Uh, we've got the formation of the 10 kingdoms, uh, which may, we may or may not see, but it's interesting to look for. So there's quite a bit of Bible prophecy to look at, and the scrolls give us several more clues uh, with all that. As far as studying prophecy, what we've always said is, basically memorize Daniel. Daniel is like the best ever as far as prophecy. Daniel and then Revelation, but Revelation is is really symbolic, hard to understand. But those two, and then there's the Ezra Apocalypse, uh, the Book of Gad, the Seer, the Testament of Noah is amazing for setting the chronology parts together. And then there's uh, whatever the Dead Sea Scrolls say about prophecy in general. And then the early church fathers, because they will come around and say, well, we've always been told by the apostles and everybody, this is how you interpret it. And it's basically the same. I, I'm just excited to see the scrolls and the church fathers uh, interpret the Bible the same way we always have. And it's just very logical. But to know that's the way it was been given is pretty amazing. Absolutely. And many of those books that you mentioned, you have available uh, online. Um, for those who might not be familiar with uh, Dr. Ken Johnson, he, he, he actually has uh, English translations that he's done himself of many of these books. Um, where can people get your books and follow you online? Um, Biblefacts.org is our main website. And then you mentioned the DSScalendar.org for the calendar stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. But we have a uh, YouTube broadcast with a, a live Q&A every Monday night. Currently, we've been studying the book of Enoch. We started at the first of the year and we're going through that now. Um, but we have that. And then we have uh, uh, the bookstore there on the website. They're basically just links to Amazon. So, you know, your credit card is safe and all that. But we have 34 books, I believe. I'm working on my, my next one, my number 35. Hopefully, I'll have that done for the uh, Prophecy Watchers Conference this spring or this, this summer, rather. Oh, awesome. What's that one about? Um, smaller Dead Sea Scrolls that contain prophecy. So there's actually um, a lot of their commentaries on the minor prophets and uh, a lot of little scrolls that talk a lot about uh, mainly first coming prophecies, but there's quite a bit of second coming prophecies in there too. And, and they're really amazing. I, I remember I always read Nahum and I always thought mm -hmm. to myself, why am I reading Nahum? It's just straightforward that it has nothing to do with me. You know, but it's like, no, it'd have something to do with you or it wouldn't be in the Bible. You read the Dead Sea Scroll commentary and boy, was I wrong. There's actually quite a bit in there. And then we have almost the entire Habakkuk commentary, which is very eye opening. Oh, been fantastic. Whenever that comes out, we'll have to have you back on to talk about it. That sounds great. Uh, as we uh, conclude the free section here, uh, what do you want most for the audience to take away from uh, the interview so far? Um, just that we need to study. Um, and it's not hard. We don't need to like try to kill ourselves doing it, but uh, study, come to a conclusion, build on what you're doing, understand that there are cults out there that twist things. But if the scrolls that are pre New Testament and the New Testament, and then the early church fathers that are post New Testament 
all say the same thing, that's probably true. And then later on in the medieval church, if we get this, you know, there is no pre-trib rapture, you need to worship angels or whatever happens. Uh, the Kabbalah and other stuff like that comes along later. You can ignore those. And so to understand we're in that time period, uh, we're going to be here a little while longer. It's not going to end like in the next 10 seconds. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to happen in the near future. And even at that point, we don't know how long we're going to live. You could have a heart attack at any moment. So we really need to get our lives right with the Lord. And that's not hard to do either. It's just something that needs to be done. You need to recognize that you are a sinner. I am too. We all have problems. Nobody's perfect. But the Lord came and fixed that for us. So if we accept him as our savior, we can have a free gift of eternal life. That's the major point. And I think that's the whole reason for prophecy, because there's no way you or I could tell the future and make it happen. Uh, but somebody did. And if they can do that and they say, I can give you eternal life if you just simply do this, I think that's a pretty safe bet, too. I totally agree. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to head into the members only section. And if you're viewing at home, you will not want to miss it because we have some phenomenal uh, viewer questions about Enoch, uh, Nephilim, and so much more. So to get the full video, head on over to dailyrenegade.com and get a membership. It's only $10 a month or 100 a year. And if you can, I highly suggest getting the 100 a year because it's technically cheaper in the long run. Essentially, you get two months for free. So go get a membership today. Watch the full video. Join in on our uh, community, a Daily Renegade social media play, uh, page on the website, dailyrenegade.com. It's for members only. And there you can make your own profile. You can post. You can uh, comment on other others' uh, posts. It's a great way to fellowship uh, that the, you know, it, it, it's a way that the church is desperately missing today. So head on over to dailyrenegade.com. Get a membership today. Okay. If you are viewing on the website, just hold on the line. You don't have to do anything. Uh, and we'll get right back to it. Everyone else viewing for free on YouTube or Rumble, thank you so much. And until next time, take care and God bless.